proprietary hard rubber and high performance rails. Let's check out the Boston Sack Shop M Series. Hi, and welcome to the Saxophone Academy. I'm Dr. Wally Wallace, and if you're interested in saxophone masterclasses and product reviews, please do consider subscribing and be sure to hit the like button to make your M series more of a M mm series. Now today we're checking out the $450 mouthpiece from the Boston Sax Shop. We're gonna do a playing test, talk specs, value for money, and give a warning to some players. But we're gonna see, is it worth this price tag? I believe it is, and spoiler alert, it's a hoot to play. So the M-Series is the first Alto mouthpiece released by the Boston Sax Shop. They already have a couple of tenor models available. If you don't know the Boston Sax Shop, they took the saxophone world by storm a couple of years ago. Their owner, Jack, is highly involved, hosts Instagram Lives, gets to know the community, and hosts a very impressive roster of artists who play on his reeds and his equipment. So I've been a fan of the Boston Sax Shop reeds for a while, and when I heard there was finally an Alto mouthpiece, I reached out, and Jack kindly sent me one for review. I did not buy this, but I also do not make any money. I have declined any affiliate sales or any links that could make me money. So this is my honest opinion of the mouthpiece. I don't have any financial incentive. Though Jack does a great job of supporting his artist roster. So if you use their codes, their discount codes, you actually help make them a little bit of money and support their careers fighting pizza rats in New York. So I would encourage you to use the promo code BITTY B-I-T-T-Y, and support my friend Chris Bittner, who's living up in New York, playing jazz saxophone. So buy some stuff and help him eat. So whenever I review a mouthpiece, I take a couple of weeks to really get to know it. I court it, I romance it, and try to take a lot of time figuring out which reeds are gonna work best on this. So in doing so, it takes a while to really get to know a mouthpiece, feel comfortable with it, which makes doing a back-to-back -back comparison to another mouthpiece that isn't very similar not a great fit. So I looked for what would be an obvious comparison, the Meyer, obviously, and it was different. And I reached out to Jack, we had a nice conversation that this is Meyer inspired, but it's not a Meyer clone or homage. The way Jack describes it, it is a reverse engineered Meyer. So what I took that to mean is there's a vibe, a sound, that mid-century kind of retro vibe that we all love, going for the sound, not copying the specs or measurements of the mouthpiece. And in effect, we do get that mid-century retro vibe, but it plays and sounds very different than a Meyer. Any of the Meyers I played, stock or vintage or otherwise. So I'm not comparing this directly to the Meyer. Think of this as a Meyer inspired, but it is definitely a mouthpiece all its own. So let's talk specs. It comes in three tip openings, a 567, which is 71, 76, and 81 thousandths of an inch respectively. The one I'm demoing here today is a seven facing that 81 thousandths of an inch, which is pretty big. Don't act like you're not impressed. It's got a medium, medium largish round chamber. And what that does is give it a transparent core, much like the Meyer, though more so than the Meyer in other registers. Now he is coming out later with an S series mouthpiece, which will have, I assume, more of a horseshoe chamber, S being inspired by the summer. Soloist. So the large round chamber, think of a more open ah syllable. When we have narrow sidewalls, like on my 56 select mouthpiece, we get more of a ooh core, a warmer core. So this has a kind of clear, transparent core. Now the chamber is not what makes it play so different than the Meyer. We're going to address two things that really do make this a beast all of its own. First is the baffle. Unlike the really good vintage Myers, which have kind of a steep drop off of the rollover baffle at the tip, this has a long, more gradual baffle that goes much further down, kind of taking into the chamber. And that does have a couple of big benefits we'll talk about in a second. The next big thing that is very different is the side rails and how they open up it to the window of the mouthpiece. So the baffle design was one of Jack's attempts to address a weakness, in his opinion, of the Meyer mouthpiece, which is a nice full sound in the middle and low end, but the palm keys and above can get very thin. So when you lengthen the rollover baffle, we still get a lot of power, but it does create a fullness in the palm keys, which I think you'll hear in the playing test. That was certainly my experience. <laughs>
Now, the other big difference between this and a Meyer, and frankly, most other non-artisan handcrafted mouthpieces, are the side rails. They are thin. They are very thin. Now, Jack takes great pride in these very thin side rails and views it as a point of craftsmanship. The mass-produced mouthpieces, it's very difficult to get very thin side rails while still being symmetrical and even and well finished. And if they do thin side rails and they're not finished well, well then, welcome to Chirpington, population U, named Squeaky. It's really not a pleasant experience to have thin side rails that are not finished well. I found these to be very finished well and played exceptionally well with an uncanny quick response. So the overall result I found was a level of nuance and control that I don't see in mass-produced mouthpieces, especially in the softer dynamics. I felt I had an incredible amount of control and detail I could pull from this mouthpiece. You'll also find the facing curve is sensitive. The way it pulls away from where most people are going to have the fulcrum of their mouth upon the reed is highly sensitive, meaning a little bit of motion goes a long way. You can bend notes a long way. Don't overdo it. If you're one of my students listening, don't overdo the bends and scoops. But it also means the vibrato, a lot of colors and variants for very little jaw motion. And perhaps the coup de gras, my favorite part of this combination of elements. I don't know if it's specifically the thin side rails, the baffle, the chamber, or likely a combination of all of them, is articulation. It really is unique. It's subtle. There's going to be a lot of, if you're kind of a beginning player, you're not going to notice the difference. But the more advanced and professional players will really feel a difference in the punchiness of the articulation. Now, we want a very quick punchy response, but we don't want it to be overly poppy or plucky or chirpy. We want a nice full bodied punch. And this was just very satisfying to lean into and articulate. It was really a pleasant experience to play, very satisfying. <laughs> So I know a lot of you are thinking now, it plays very well. So do a lot of mouthpieces that cost 50% less. What justifies this price tag? Well, it's highly subjective, but a couple of reasons why it might for you is, number one, they're artisan made. He only makes a couple of hundred a year, and there is a lot of hand attention in detail from an artisan making these mouthpieces. And one of the pluses of that is they play very individually. If you get several of the exact same facing, being that they're hand worked on and not just finished by a machine, they're all going to have slightly, slightly unique characters and flavors to the sound. Hello, Mark Sixes, anyone? And that's highly desirable to a lot of people. These small differences will be missed by a lot of players, and that's okay. These aren't intended for everyone. Jack likens it to the difference between a tube amp versus solid-state mass-manufactured amps. A lot of people won't care. A lot of people will want the little bit of character and cork that you find in something that's more handmade. Now, another reason this may be worth it to you is the proprietary hard rubber. D wait, I know. Everyone uses the word proprietary to describe their material. Whatever they make anything from, it's always proprietary. In this case, Jack is very proud of the hard rubber. He says it's a step up even from German bar stock hard rubber, which a lot of boutique mouthpieces are made from. The big difference is going to be resiliency, lasting a long time, keeping the curvature facing, 
and the crispness of the contact points. Because as a reed, I don't mean to insult your intelligence, but as the reed vibrates year after year after year, it can start to soften and round out and also kind of change the curvature of the mouthpiece after years and years of it being clamped down with a metal ligature. So this hard rubber, according to Jack, has a higher resiliency, should last longer. And remember, Van Doren says you should replace your hard rubber mouthpiece every three years. But then again, they sell a $700 ligature, so maybe we should take that with a grain of pink Himalayan sea salt. I have a feeling this will last you throughout your playing career. Now, a downside or a warning to consider beyond the price. If you play Legere, I think this is not going to be a good mouthpiece for you. The reason being, very thin side rails means you need to have your reed lined up very precisely. Slight deviations from side to side, something with thick side rails, there's some forgiveness and you may not even notice. With very thin side rails, you have to have it lined up nearly perfectly. And with Legere, that dark, translucent -y plastic is hard to line up on most mouthpieces. This is not going to be fun. I don't think you're gonna have a good time, especially with a lot of ligatures. The Legere is a little slippery. It can move in the slight motion. You're not gonna get the performance you want. I brought this up with Jack and said, this is a nightmare for Legere. And he was frankly like, cool, <laughs> play Boston Sack Shop reads on it. And I don't blame him. So if you play Legere, I would stay away from this. I don't think you're going to have a good time. But then again, I don't think there's going to be a lot of crossover between Legere and this kind of boutique mouthpiece. That could be wrong. Now, most importantly, have you had experience with the Boston Sack Shop or chatted with Jack online? And what do you think of his products? Let me know in the comments below. I'll be back next week when we learn to play with even better tone quality. And I will see you very soon. Go practice.